In the previous lesson, I introduced you to the first and the second fundamental theorem of welfare economics, which uh, justifies the competitive markets as an efficient way of, uh, of uh, allocating resources. So in the second theme, then, then uh, we discussed the possibility of market failure and what types of, uh, in what type of situations the markets might fail to, to allocate resources efficiently. So recall from the previous lesson that I introduced this um, list from a textbook by Perman et al., uh, which indicates this uh, seven conditions for the or the, that the, the ideal market economy should satisfy. And these are also important uh, assumptions behind these, uh, these uh, fundamental theorems of welfare economics. So in this lesson, we now then go through this, uh, these different, uh, seven different uh, assumptions. And I also then uh, give you some examples of uh, of uh, how and why those those conditions might fail or in what kind of situation. So those uh, market failures, uh, there can be, of course, many, many different uh, ways that these assumptions uh, are not satisfied. And this is called market failure. And there exists also a lot of uh, different types of market failure. So the, the, the following list that I will give you, uh, it's mainly, mainly just uh, illustrative examples. Okay. So let's go through then one by one these conditions to, to get some more insight. Then. And here on the on the on the right hand side, I then have the 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 corresponding uh, uh, market failure. So let us start from the the first condition. So that uh, that uh, first condition is that markets exist for all goods and services produced and consumed. But of course, um, in reality, we know that there exists a lot of uh, lot of non-market goods. That uh, that if you think about, for example, just clean air. Uh, then, of course, if you think about more this kind of um, human society, there can be a lot of a uh, lot of this kind of um, uh, aspects such as respect or authority or relationships that are really valuable and are. are are important for our, our well-being, but which are not necessarily um, traded in the markets. So, for example, the Beatles were singing that you can't buy buy love. So, I do believe that there exist also many many important goods and services that uh, are not available in the market, and maybe maybe cannot be even in principle. Now then, the second condition is that uh, that all markets are perfectly competitive. Now, if we then look at the the real world markets, then of course there exist monopolies, there exist oligopolies, and then there is this kind of even more general term monopolistic competition. In the real world, fir firms are often uh, differentiating their their products. They are trying to be be different from others to 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 gain some kind of degree of monopoly power, so that they can then get a, get a higher price than their their competitors. So uh, it's it seems that uh, that um, it's not very uh, at least not self evident that uh, that even if we have some kind of functioning markets that they are perfectly competitive. That very often firms do have some kind of some degree of of market power. And, and that can be also, of course, in the in not only in the consumer markets, but we also also need to think about the um, factor markets, for for example, labor market and capital market. So of course, there can be also a lot of market power in the in the labor market. Now the third condition that uh, states that all transactors have perfect information. So meaning that uh, that uh, buyers and sellers they understand what is the what kind of contract they are they are going to make what is the uh, quality of the of the good, but there exists of course uh, if you think about the economic theory then then there is notions such as adverse selection, and and moral hazard. So if you think about the 
the adverse selection, for example, is often often referred to the insurance markets. So if the if the insurance company is offering some kind of, um, uh, for example, some kind of house insurance, then then of course in some sense the the consumers. Uh, who have a, let's say a wooden house or have a higher risk of, of, uh, of that their house will be burning down, then they are of course the more likely to take the insurance. Whereas if you have the, if you're a client with a very small risk, uh, then you might for example prefer not to not to make take this uh, insurance. So then the clients of the insurance um, uh, company may then have a, a face higher risk than than the the general population at large so this is referred to as the adverse selection uh then there is another another is is the is the moral hazard so then for example if you think about the the car insurance so so then if the uh, if the insured person has a very very good coverage in the car insurance uh, then it might also then uh, then uh, allow the consumer to to uh, take engage in more risky behavior because they know that then even if there is a car accident then they they will get get the full coverage whereas a person without uh, without insurance then would uh, would perhaps uh, drive more cautiously because they know that if there is some accident then they will have a more uh, have a bigger uh, bigger economic loss as a result so these are some examples of how this how this perfect information might be. Then there can be also like a, a asymmetric information that, the, for example, the seller knows the the good much better than the the buyer, and the buyer cannot necessarily um, uh, find out everything about the, the the quality before making this purchasing decision. Now then let's move to the fourth condition which states that private property rights are fully assigned in all resources and commodities so we will talk about this property rights issue issue in more more detail also in the next lesson but then of course this uh, this is something that can be very uh, very closely related to many many environmental problems uh, so if you recall this, uh, this uh, notion of the cost theorem that I introduced in the previous lesson, um, so Ronald Coase was arguing that uh, it's enough if uh, if we assign the property rights uh, uh, carefully enough, so then these private individuals uh, can uh, uh, negotiate this kind of harm done by the by the external effects uh, away. But then in the real world, we have often this kind of, for example, open access resources or common pool resources. So I mentioned here on this slide, the fish stock. So if we have, for example, um, some uh, some stock of fish, uh, which which can be a common pool resources. So anybody just can come and, and try to catch this fish with different types of uh, baits or nets. So, so that might result as an... Uh, uh, overfishing because you have these uh, individual fishers are just uh, caring about their own own catch and they want to want to catch as much fish as they possibly can and when there's not any kind of restriction to this kind of common pool resources it might be that then then that this uh, fish stock is uh, um, uh, depleted too much then it would be a social socially optimal it might be even that this uh, this uh, particular fish species is uh, is uh, going to the extinction so this is one one important and, and related to this kind of natural resources and uh, and um, uh, one 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 important type of market failure related to this kind of uh, uh, environmental problems and, and natural resource management problems compared to the situation that uh, for example you have some privately owned lake where the owner can then uh, restrict access to this lake and and uh, and uh, do this kind of more sustainable fishing then of course the owner owner of the lake wouldn't uh, wouldn't have incentive to to overfish because then it would uh, would uh, decrease the uh, the owner's uh, well-being in the future, or perhaps the next generations of the of the owner. 
So we come back to this this uh, this shortly. But let's move on to the to the fifth qu uh, question, which is that uh, simply assuming that no externalities exist, and of course there are many many examples of uh, externalities such as uh, uh, pollution, but also noise. We can think about traffic congestion. So very often these kind of kind of environmental environmental problems are actually related to the externalities or this kind of environmental uh, damage is done as a result of this kind of external effects that uh, that of course no firm no no consumer is is uh, uh, interested in polluting uh, polluting the environment but uh, but if this uh, uh, person is not uh, held accountable or, or firm is not held accountable and and the polluting doesn't cost anything then uh, then uh, this firm and the, or the individual then doesn't really take this kind of pollution caused uh, that that causes damage to the environment and damage to the causes harm to other users uh, um, then uh, then uh, this person just simply doesn't take it into account in the in the production decision or the consumption decision so i come back also to this e question of externalities uh, uh, later on and i will also devote even even uh, uh, several lessons to this uh, pollution control but here let's move to the sixth question sixth condition which is stating that all goods and services are private goods so uh, then the opposite of, of private good is a public good. And there are also several important, uh, important types of public goods. Think about, for example, law enforcement or, or national, national defense, which, uh, which are so-called public goods. So I will come back to the like, specific definition of what, what, what is the distinction between a private good and public good later on. But at this point, I think it's, it's sufficient to note that uh, that also this kind of public goods are somewhat problematic to the to the to the market. So 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 the market economy itself it doesn't doesn't necessarily manage to organize some kind of uh, uh, national defense. And in some sense, also one might be also worried if you had some kind of uh, private army uh, taking care of the national defense. If you have some kind of uh, uh, profit maximizing. Uh, uh, global company taking care of the national defense, then then uh, it might be also that they would simply then then uh, convert to the to the enemy side if if the enemy is paying paying them better. So then it's also like difficult to make sure that then this the national defense is actually loyal to the to the population that it is supposed to to protect. And also, I want to highlight that this this uh, issue of public goods is often also highly highly important for the for the environmental problems. So then, oh, okay, the second part of the statement was that simply assuming away that this this kind of public goods are not uh, not uh, not available. So that's of course in some sense a limiting assumption in this kind of. Uh, um, uh, models based on this kind of simplifying assumptions. So the third, oh, third, sorry, seventh, seventh condition stated in the in the permanent old book is that uh, all utility and production functions are well behaved, and this is of course very very common in uh, in economic models. Uh, so there exists some kind of examples of violations that, for example, if we have some. Uh, economies of scale that uh, that uh, that violate the uh, concavity assumption of the production functions uh, then it is possible that this kind of uh, um, uh, well-defined general equilibrium doesn't doesn't necessarily exist so that this is maybe the seventh uh, condition is more like technical assumptions about the the existence of the of the general equilibrium but uh, if we think about this uh, now, if we focus on the on the issues and types of market failure that are most relevant for the for the um, uh, environmental and, and natural resource economics, then uh, it would be I would say that it is these uh, 
uh, number four, five, and six. So the fourth was this question of property rights. And if the property rights are not assigned or they are contested, then that can lead to, to environmental problems, partly because it, it would then uh, prevent the possibility of this, uh, this kind of private bargaining between parties that the Coase theorem would, would require. Then this kind of existence of externalities is an important uh, source of market failures that leads to environmental problems. And the sixth is the existence of, of public goods. So in the next lesson, I will focus then on these three in more detail still, but, but also like if you think about this, that, okay, why do we care so much about this list of, uh, of different kind of uh, conditions and, uh, and, and uh, what classifying these types of market failures. So, so the point I want to make here is that, that of course, um, we, we think that, uh, that based on these uh, fundamental theorems of welfare economics, that, uh, that competitive markets is a very efficient way of, uh, of allocating resources, allocating goods and services, and, and uh, getting this kind of uh, uh, economic efficient uh, allocation. Okay, so then our idea is that we look into this kind of specific circumstances where the markets fail, and then this will justify then some kind of government intervention. So, so, so if we can identify this kind of situations where market fail, then that gives a strong justification for the government to then, then uh, um, interfere with the markets or, 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 or make at least some kind of, kind of for example, taxes or, or subsidies to, to correct for these market failures. So that's that's why I pay so much attention also to this kind of uh, specific uh, assumptions of the welfare economics and also these types of failures in the in the real world, which justify then the some kind of government intervention that we will then consider later on when we consider some kind of like uh, policy instruments that the, the governments might might need. So these give the theoretical justification of using these types of. Uh, policy instruments that we consider later. So in the next lesson, then uh, uh, I will focus on more detail to this, uh, these uh, three types of market failures. And as a, as a name of the lesson, I will refer to externalities and public goods, but I will also talk about this uh, property rights. See you then. Bye bye.